From the Sky News Centre, this is Paul Murray Live. Thank you, great man. Happy Tuesday. Lots to get to tonight, so let's not muck around. Now, obviously, there's a lot of really difficult stuff around in the world, so I often get asked by people, can you start with some good news? I am tonight going to start with some good news that will unite the entire country. It's to do with Christina Keneally. Remember the mean girl who, of course, found ways to fail upwards in her political career, from a terrible minister to a terrible premier to a terrible candidate and been along to an awful person in the Senate who wasn't able to hold on, I mean politically of course, able to hold on to her own Senate leadership position so she said, no, no, I'm now going to go downstairs and I'm going to run for Fowler. I will take my rightful place as an eventual Labor leader. Well, of course, the very good people of Fowler decided, no thanks, you can stay back at Scotland Island. We're going to vote for a true local in Di Lee. Di Lee is the sensational local leader who, of course, was able to take on this Labor legend. And the result was Krista Nicanelli sent back to Scotland Island. Well, what's the good news, Paul? Thanks for the history lesson, but what's the good news? She gave an interview today, that being KK, to the Australian Financial Review, and it's the very end of the article that brings me the good news today. Asked about a possible return to Parliament, Ms Keneally says, it was not on the cards. I fully love my job and see this as most likely my last career step. Certainly, if there's another step, it won't be towards elected politics, it will be firmly away from it. Hallelujah, baby! So... Enjoy Scotland Island. Now, as you know, there was, understandably, a global reaction to the outrageous protests that followed the Hamas attacks a couple of weeks ago on the steps of the Sydney Opera House. Now, of course, at the time, we commented about how the brass of the police force could not have handled this in a worse fashion. In chapter and verse, and in a great detail, I told you about how it was an illegal protest, and as an illegal protest, you could fine the people in charge of it. They haven't been fined. It was obviously antagonistic because that was the night when the sails were being lit up in the colours of Israel, the country that had been attacked by Hamas, and anyone taking the streets on that day, in my view, was pro-Hamas. Now, as the weeks have rolled on, Karma heads have prevailed in some of these protests, but still some nasty things are being said. But remember when the police said this and basically gave the green light to the people who had already taken a green light to disgrace themselves, their cause and Australia? We can't stop a thousand people uh, meeting in one spot. It depends on their behaviour once they get there. Ridiculous. Well, we learned today via some excellent reporting in the Australian newspaper about some of the behind the scenes some of the behind-the-scenes carry-on that was going on from some of the top brass at the very top of the New South Wales Police Force, where they were concerned that it was being lit up at all, let alone what the protest was that they say they couldn't control because you can't stop a 1,000 people. Let's read together. Internal New South Wales Police emails have revealed the apprehension that the force held behind the seemingly snap decision to light the Opera House on Monday, October 9. Well, of course, it was a snap decision because nobody knew the previous week what was about to happen in Israel. But, of course, it did. How many people dead? How many people had been taken capture? Hence why the immediate reaction and the correct decision of the New South Wales Police Force was to light up the Opera House. But the reporting continues. The Commissioner is concerned that the government's decision to light up the Opera House may cause additional problems in the community and is seeking an assessment on any additional threat that may be caused. You see, the police didn't want it to be lit up because they were afraid about what the reaction would be. Rather than showing solidarity with the people who had been terrorised, captured and murdered. No, no, the concern was whether this was going to annoy the same types of people who took to the streets of Lakemba to let off fireworks and say that was one of the happiest days of their lives. Again, remember if this was people back in the COVID days, they were more than happy to shut down a 1,000 people. This reporting again continues. It is amazing what was happening behind the scenes. Such was the concern initially about the threat of escalation. Because, of course, rather than Australia making its own decisions about showing sympathy for people who had been murdered and attacked, oh, no, 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 whether this would escalate some people's feelings. Well, that, of course, means because those people may overreact, you should not do the right thing in lighting it up in the first place. Unbelievable. They even picked up the phone to counterparts 
to see what the potential fallout would be. Police also received information that the Palestinian community was incensed about the decision to light up the sails. Now, I don't believe that's the entire Palestinian community. It was the pro-Hamas community who decided to turn up immediately after and essentially rubbing the Jewish community's nose in the actions of Hamas. Now, again, secret behind the scenes and well done to the Oz for getting it. He, name redacted, says the reason for the move of the rally towards the Opera House being lit up is a significant concern for the Palestinian community and they are incensed by the decision of lighting the sails. So the police knew, and this again, buried lead, that we were right about what we said a couple of weeks ago. The police knew that there was a plan to move from outside of Town Hall, which is an area where, of course, you can completely lock in those people. So the hundreds of people who were there, many of whom ended up marching throughout the streets of Sydney and then eventually creating the trouble down at the Opera House, they could have been stopped at Town Hall. But the police did nothing. Instead, they let it go, they let it ferment. They let them turn up in the forecourt of the Opera House and you all know what took place there. I don't know what was happening with the brass of the New South Wales police force, but they could not have got this more wrong. The behaviour of the initial protests in the days after the Hamas attack exposed the police as being ones that were willing to metaphorically pull a punch because they were afraid of what the reaction would be. They didn't stop the people from moving from Town Hall, which is, as I've shown you before, a 30-minute walk from the Sydney Opera House when they had all ability to do so. Instead, they let them march. And when they eventually got to the Opera House, all they did, because you couldn't stop a 1,000 people, unless, of course, they're COVID protesters or members of the far right who must be crushed at all turns, they just stood there and guarded the glass of the Opera House. There's more to this story, and good on the odds for digging away at it. Again, what's been happening in the past few days, I've got no real problems with those protests and those marches as things have moved on but I do have major problems with what happened a couple of days after. When the New South Wales community made a decision to light up the Opera House, Jewish people were told don't turn up because it might incense the people who were pro-Hamas. That ain't the country that you and I think we live in. Now, again, more examples about how, uh, well, the yes people can't take no for an answer, let alone hell no, which, of course, was the response to the Prime Minister's $450 million self-indulgence of a referendum that they knew they were losing for month after month after month. They didn't get up anywhere by the ACT. Oh, and, of course, Marrickville and the Teal seats. We showed you last night about how part of this was a shameful victory, according to a collection of Indigenous leaders who were more than happy to call Australians racist but wouldn't put their names to it. Well, today we get a little more information from people who are willing to put their names to things like Thomas Mayo. Now, Thomas Mayo, in and of himself, despite all of the advocacy that he may well have had for the Yes campaign, the reality was it was his words and his radical words that were able to be used so freely against what the true purpose of the voice may well have been. He should have pulled himself out of the campaign, but, of course, the ego got in the way, so he had to remain at the front all the way through. Put it this way. If he was running for parliament, any major party would have removed him as a candidate because he was a distraction during that referendum, during that campaign. He says today that he has an emptiness in his chest. He says that he supports the leaders who put out that disgraceful statement yesterday... However, he has both sides. I'm conscious that it's strongly worded, and I don't want to blame the Australian people, but he supports what was said in the letter. So which is it, Thomas? What I ask people to think about is those who aspire to lead this nation in the coalition, that their behaviour, misinformation, blah, blah, blah. Of course, are the wasted opportunity. It's all Dutton's fault, not yours. Not yours for the way the campaign ran itself. Not yours for not willing to step back when you became a lightning rod for the issue. No, 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 nothing to be seen here. And as you've heard tonight, in Sydney, their Lord Mayor, Clover Moore, the one who declared a climate emergency, but get this, despite the fact there's a climate emergency, if in Sydney you put solar panels on the part of your roof you can see from the street, the council won't let you do that because of street appeal. So they're not always all in on things. They're going to have their own version of The Voice sometime soon. And what about this charmer that was up on Q&A last night? Now, of course, what uh, many have not quite pointed out is that uh, despite the fact that, yes, she's a strong Indigenous voice, she also works for GetUp, that extreme left-wing group. 
that, let's be honest, even The Voice would not have been enough. These are the people who say it's all about going back to day one and fixing the issues of the past. This, fully platformed by your ABC last night... How do we move forward? People asking about reconciliation. Personally, I think reconciliation is over. It's time for a reckoning. We cannot have reconciliation with people who do not uh, say that we exist in this country, who are not talking about the truth of what has happened. Some of the lies that were perpetrated throughout the referendum. So 60% of the country that voted no apparently voted to say that Aboriginal people don't exist. Seriously? Oh, but now it's time for the reckoning, the revolution. Let's go back to square one. I told you. This thing was going to start to move from the compromise model that was there and we're going to start to move towards the Lydia Thorpe version of things, the Aboriginal sovereignty movement, the people who believe you can't do anything for tomorrow until you deal with the sins of the past, original sin. Meantime, remember what happened to Warren Mundine on referendum day when he was literally being heckled by the oh-so, you know, more sensitive yes voters who decided to scream and yell as he was going in to make his decision to vote no, along with 60% of the entire country. Well, just as they have gone after Jacinta Price, they are continuing to go after Warren Mundine. What about this story he had this morning with Ray Hadley about what happened when he went to the doctors? And while I was sitting there, I heard my name mentioned, so I looked around thinking it might have been the nurse coming out to take me blood, but it was two people standing over in the corner. So... Then I ignored them. Then they walked outside, and after I finished with my blood test, they come out and started. They walked up to me, started abusing me, and calling me, a, uh, you know, a race traitor, and how I hated Aboriginal people, and I was a disgrace, and you know, and, and, and this is in the middle of the, you know, just out in front of the pathology mm. uh, place where everyone was looking at me, and my wife was with me as well, and I just, I just, I just smiled and said, look, you know, just bugger off, and then I walked away. <laughs> Were these white people? Yeah, they were. They were two white women, yeah. How's that? Two noxious white women who were going after an Indigenous man because he had the position that the majority of the country did as opposed to the one that makes them feel good when they're hashtagging with everyone else on Twitter. Meantime, remember this moment from election night? Well, people. we're not going to sit here we and, and take you abusing a, a national treasure like Marcia Langton, who never said that Australians were racist. And you must accept. And her the vote words were twisted. I'm going to stop you there, Warren. The people make the decisions. I think. Well, we've just seen who Warren Mundine is. Yes, um, that's right. Of course, that was referendum night. I was there as that conversation was taking place inside a Brisbane hotel. You could have heard a pin drop as everyone was starting to see what was going on. I literally was able to find it on my phone and everyone's standing around watching the other half of the conversation. It was extraordinary stuff. But today, the boss of SBS was asked about all of this and says that, yes, there have been complaints, I think eight official complaints, and the ombudsman is looking into it. But when the SBS is going to be investigating itself about the behaviour of a television presenter that's a ring-in from Channel 10, a pretty obvious activist one, well, they've already prejudged. Nothing to see here. Um, that was a very, very robust exchange between two uh, prominent Indigenous leaders. Uh, the hosts of that program were, were using their best efforts to ensure the conversation remained constructive, uh, fact-based and, and safe for all participants. What? Like, honestly, imagine being so lost in the world of bureaucracy that when a conversation gets that far out of control, the host decides to obviously side with one guest over the other. And remember, this is not commercial television. This is not the subscription services or the free-to-wear services you choose to watch. Choose to watch. This is the taxpayer-funded stuff where supposedly the presenters are all meant to be people in the middle, the ones calling the balls and strikes, the unemotional umpire. Instead, obviously stacking the deck. C can we replay that again? Literally. Now, again, I'm not suggesting this person needs to be cancelled, but the idea that they don't even have a conversation about how out of control that moment became... Again, listen to the boss of SBS saying, oh, we're currently going through a process and the ombudsman's currently looking at it, but basically the host's already off the hook. She calls one a national treasure and she pretends that she's cut off the bloke who 60% of the country agreed with. Um, that was a very, very robust exchange between two uh, prominent Indigenous leaders. Uh, the hosts of that program were, were using their best efforts to ensure the conversation remained constructive, uh, fact-based and, and safe for all participants. Seriously.
And imagine being lost in that world, lost in that world where even the ABC people said it was really difficult to deliver balance. Because, yeah, geez, they were so kind to the no case all the way through that referendum and post. But that's another knock. We'll talk about Q&A. Cost of living and doing something about it. It was the central lie to Anthony Albanese's campaign to become Prime Minister. He was the one who said in the lead-up to the election, and we've kept the receipts, a Labor government will lower the cost of living. Now, you'll notice in that there's no asterisks, there's no footnotes, there's no yeah, but only for... Pretty obvious what the message was to millions of people. Vote for us, things get better. But, of course, you know things have got worse. Consumer confidence has been in the toilet for a long period of time. Put simply, when a score is uh, as low as it's currently been, that is recession-level stuff. Now, it is ever so slightly above recession-level stuff. But inside this survey today, 53% of families told Roy Morgan that their families are financially worse off. 36% of families expect to be worse off in a year's time. 36% of people say there's going to be bad times for the Australian economy in the next year. And 50% of the country, despite the fact that a Labor government will lower the cost of living, say that now is a bad time to buy a major household item. Now, this isn't said inside the survey, but why would that be the case? Because the very things that you need to buy are now costing more because the low Australian dollar means that when you import things to the country, like most things people buy for their households, it costs more, let alone the cost of shipping those things because petrol is so high. If only the government could do something about that, like cut fuel excise by 25 cents, six months, $3 billion. They've currently got $20 billion in a surplus, but shh, well, we can't do anything about that. Meantime, of course, as the Prime Minister is feeling your pain while he's currently over in the United States on yet another overseas trip where he's taken an awful lot of staff with him and this time he's being led around by the current ambassador in Washington, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, and there will be a state visit where Anthony Albanese will not just spend a little bit of time with Joe Biden inside the uh, Oval Office, but he'll also get the full treatment, the full dinner, the full, uh, the full tuxedo treatment... And, geez, what an incredible night that's going to be. While 50% of Australians are going to say that they can't afford anything major for their household, 53% of people say they're financially worse off, millions of people can't put food on the table, the B-52s will entertain the President and Prime Minister and assorted guests at a celebration of people who claim that they care about you. But believe me, they don't. Huge reaction to what we mentioned last night, which was out of Food Bank. And Food Bank has been a charity that you know I've been supporting for a long time. John Robertson, the former Labor leader in New South Wales, is uh, one of their bosses in New South Wales. We've talked to him for as long as he's been out of politics, which is a very long time now, about the importance of this service that makes sure people can have food on their table. Yesterday, we told you 3.7 million households, which means more than 3.7 million people, but 3.7 million households are struggling to put food on the table right now. And even the message about the reality of cost of living that the government wants to ignore, that the Prime Minister will not be bringing up when he's sipping champagne and dancing to rock lobster in the next couple of days, while potentially eating some Australian lobster as well. Who knows? Well, now, according to the New Daily, which is a website which is funded by union superannuation, so you couldn't come from a more left-wing source. Well, yes, you could. It's called The Guardian, but still. Australians are now openly admitting they're stealing stuff because the cost of the food that they are struggling to keep on their table, 3.7 million households, means they're now starting to think about flogging things. More than one in 10 Australians, or about 2.4 million people, have confessed that they've stolen from a business in the past year. The most common theft that is happening in supermarket checkouts, 5% of people are just walking out without paying for their groceries. 4% of respondents admit to deliberately scanning an item that is cheaper than the product that they really want from a self-serve checkout. And amazingly, there's this story today. Now, we know that climate change is often cited by uh, younger generations as the reason they don't want to have kids. What about the good old-fashioned reason, which is they can't afford it? Well, that's exactly, again, what parts of the ABC have uh, been reporting. They spoke to a lady called Candace, not her real name, where she says the reason she's not having a kid is because of the economy. She says she has visceral anger, as she feels, about not being able to afford to have a child because of the cost of living and the housing crisis. 
Oh, but it's OK. The Prime Minister, he feels your pain. You see, because he says cost of living a lot, he'll, he's clearly doing something about it. Yeah, right. This cost of living crisis. On the cost of living. Cost of living crisis. Issues of, uh, of cost of living. Cost of living. Cost of living. Means cost of living is a massive concern. Cost of living. Enduring cost of living. Cost of living. Cost of living. Cost of living. Oh, yeah, and just to tighten the screws, guess what the Reserve Bank Governor, you know, the hand-picked one who obviously was picked because the last one was so evil because he kept putting up interest rates? Well, guess what the brand-new Governor of the Reserve Bank has said tonight? She will not be hesitating in lifting interest rates. Why? Because inflation is out of control. What, in part, is one of the biggest drivers of inflation? Oh, that's right, petrol prices. Are you telling me that petrol prices, which are going to push inflation, which is going to push the Reserve Bank, is the reason interest rates go up, yet the government may well be able to spend $3 billion of its $20 billion extra on reducing the fuel excise and thus the price of inflation, meaning they could actually do something for cost of living? Of course not. He's too busy in the love shack with Joe Biden. I ask it over and over again. Queensland, when will you have enough of Anastasia Palaszczuk. When will you send her packing? She is the most successful female politician of all time in Australia, leader of a government that wasn't just elected but re-elected multiple times. The media unit around her works very tightly with the people who run the TV stations up at Mount Cutha, so the message is always pro-government. They never really call out what happens because, you see, the hope is that if you end up working for... Uh, if you end up leaving channels, uh, the, the, those TV stations, where can you get a job? Oh, that's right, the Premier's office like many, 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 many others have, or dozens have, since she became the Premier. And, of course, we know latest polls suggest that she will lose the election which will be held about this time next year. But the polls have shown that before. So this Premier has always found a way to somehow make herself look better than the reality of what her government actually is to Queensland. Well, she has used taxpayers' money to make a new ad. To make a new ad that's all about her. That's clearly a Labor Party election ad. It's all about Queensland. It's all about how much she loves Queensland. It's all about pictures of her as a kid. I'll spare you most of the vom, but you might have to throw up a little bit in your mouth with this. We are building a better Queensland, one the world is only just discovering. Let's keep going, as our best days are still ahead of us. I'm pretty sure anyone who knows any history of uh, Queensland knows that the rest of the world well and truly was aware of Queensland from, say, the 1970s and 80s. Lots of tourism around the Gold Coast. The world has already worked out Queensland is awesome. And it ain't awesome because of her. In fact, it is being held back because of the Premier and her government. But some of the reaction which popped up at the Courier Mail's website today I thought is worth reporting to you. Justin says, sorry, Anna, we just can't trust you. Maxwell says, it's time for the worst state government in Queensland history to be dumped. Rob says that Anna versus Crucifully, Anna will uh, walk it in. Dave says, what a load of lies, BS and spin from the Queen of Lies and Spin. Danny says, stop wasting taxpayers' money, do something about youth crime. Anthony, a blatant use of taxpayers' money. John says, how does she justify using taxpayers' money to pay for a Labor Party campaign ad? Well, it's funny you say that, because the Courier Mail actually tried to ask that question. Why do people who work for the Premier not the head of the Labor Party, where they're paid for by the taxpayer, how are they allowed to make something that's so overtly political? Well, let's read. Ms Palaszczuk voiced and released the high-production, taxpayer-funded video, trumpeting the government's achievements and asking for voters to give her a fourth term. Again, this is party political stuff. But because they have done such a good job, Labor, over, what, the best part of 30 years minus three, about 27 years of being indivisible from the taxpayer and the political party, but how's this for an absolute admission that, yeah, it was taxpayers' funds that paid for it? A spokesman for the Premier, probably former TV journalist who left from Mount Cutha, but anyway, said the video was produced internally with no added expense to the taxpayers. Oh, no, just the initial expense of paying these people to be the former journalists who leave journalism to go and work for the Premier. However... Not mentioned in the ad is the reality of Queensland right now. And let me just pick three examples of why you need to change the government. Believe it or not, some good news from the ABC today. High demand for Brisbane properties is showing that the rental crisis is particularly bad in Queensland. Why? At Bowen Hills, there was just one property. One property, when it gets listed, 127 people want to look at it. In West Ipswich, 
One property available for rent is looked at by 124 people. In Ellen Grove, it's 120. In Ipswich, it's 119. In Woodbridge, it's 118. And she talks about hospitals, but apart from no mention, of course, about putting hospital patients at SeaWorld, which is exactly the record of this government, what about ambulance ramping? When ambulances can't come to your place when you call Triple O because they're waiting for hours and hours and hours out the front of the useless hospital system that this government's put in place every day since Palaszczuk became Premier. Well, ramping is at a record high. In fact, it's never been worse. So even if she promises to fix it, she's fixing her own mess. Then, of course, there's youth crime, an issue that we've done shows on, that we talk about, and every place we've gone, people only want to talk about this because it's their lives that are being ruined. And thankfully, there's a collection of people who want to fight back against this Premier, and they are willing to even get a say, believe it or not, on the Channel 9 News, a rare moment of not doing the Premier's bidding. Have a look at this bloke who's been dealing with crime for 40 years. I've never seen the community so concerned as they are at the moment about crime and we've all, all of us I think would know victims of crime at this stage and there are people living in fear and that should not be the case in Queensland so I'd say it's probably as worse as I've seen. And then there's of course the appointment of Dr Jeanette Young as the Governor. You know the Governor that spends hundreds of thousands of dollars on travel and thirty thousand dollars on a pool covering for Government House. But shh, they're in it for you. Really? I don't think so. Quick break. Back with more. Rita Panahi, the Persian princess. She joins the debate straight after the break. And none other than the great Nigel Farage. You got us on a big night. Superstars night. All kill. <laughs> Told you it was an all-star night. With me in the Man Cave. Final time. He's going to go off and be a big brain in the United States for a little while. None other than the great Sam Crosby. Michael Kroger joins us from Melbourne. And he's coughing a little bit because, geez, the hairspray. The Persian princess. David, the, the, <laughs> was just going ballistic, <laughs> ballistic during the ad break. But lovely to yeah. see you, Rockstar. Yeah. Too long, my gorgeous. <laughs> I've missed you, Paul. I've missed you. I missed you too, gorgeous. Poor, uh, poor Michael. He's going, I didn't need it. My hair's fine. Anyway, uh, so <laughs> some of the yes people won't take no for an answer. Let's take our pick here. Everything from Clover Moore saying I'll have my own voice through to um, the uh, unsigned letter, which was pretty nasty uh, yesterday, through to the Sheila on Q&A saying that it's time for a reckoning. Sam, um, you're now free <laughs> to speak because there is no longer a party line. Do some people have to learn to take no for an answer? Look, they do, but the problems haven't gone away, right? Sure. So, no one's so you know, I will absolutely accept 60% of the country said no to a constitutional voice, obviously, right? So that proposal is dead, buried, cremated in Tony Abbott's favourite uh, phrase. Mm. But... but. The problems, but. Ha no, mm. but the problems haven't gone away, right? <laughs> yeah, you were still talking about one of the no. most underprivileged uh, areas. And, you know, from the Yes campaigners' side, yeah, there's going to be a period where they're pretty unhappy. You know, they feel pretty, pretty upset about the whole oh. thing. You but know. I love that nobody seemed... You know, Rita, I've got to say, you know, while it wasn't the way that I uh, voted, there were plenty of people who uh, voted no in same-sex marriage. I, I don't remember an awful lot of uh, their feelings afterwards and a week-long, two-week, three-week, mm. four-months conversation about the minority of people there or the no campaign, all the rest of it. But... Um, of course, elections don't matter anymore. It's only about which way Booths vote in Palm Island. That's technically the way we're going to decide all elections from now on. Um, look, at some point, you have, to, you have to take no for the answer, and it means the idea of this sort of separate representative body is not what Australians want. No means no, Paul. I don't know how more simply I can put it. No means no. And having a mass tantrum, uh, these absurd letters uh, penned anonymously, I mean, at least have the courage to put your name to these words, uh, it's not going to make any difference. If anything, it's alienating people even more. So if you had another vote, I would... Uh, uh, bet that it would be even a lower vote for the yes camp. Uh, Australians don't want racial separatism. They don't want racial privilege enshrined into our constitution. They made that clear. The yes camp had all the advantages. We know that. They had all the money. They had all the corporate support. They had the sporting bodies, the celebrities, the activist class, academia, the bulk of the media, and they still lost, and they lost resoundingly. So if the yes camp 
do want to have uh, some of their agenda implemented, they need to have some self-reflection, not a tantrum. Also, Michael, I mean, we see what the immediate play is. Uh, we said it, of course, the night after the referendum that the media is going to go full Trump on Dutton. Uh, of course, they tried to suggest that yeah. he was, uh, you know, a referendum <laughs> denier because of the ticks and crosses thing. Mm, uh, yeah. Now, of course, multiple Thomas Mayo, all the rest of it, that if it wasn't for the evil libs, the Australian population would have still been back at 60-40 their way. How does Dutton compete against this? Because the reality is it's one thing for the yes-no campaign that's now been run, but... We certainly know that when they turn up the noise on Morrison, the country either was already there or ended up there. They're going to do the same to Dutton. How does he get around that noise? Completely different environment and different issue. Dutton needs to do exactly what he's doing, uh, play a straight bat to all of this. As you've said and Rita said, um, this, this long period of, of uh, unhappiness is damaging the S case very badly. The result wasn't close, mate. It wasn't close. It was thumping. And it's headed towards a 38 uh, in due course, I think. It's going to go below 39 if the counting trend continues. And m the most important thing to note is this. This ongoing period of, of complaining about the democratic process is continuing to do Albanese a lot of damage because he's associated with this. Mm. He is now getting blamed for this. Why do I say that? Because the poll in the Financial Review tomorrow morning reveals that for the first time since the election, Albanese has lost his lead to Dutton. It's now 49 to Labor and 51 to the Coalition. Wow. wow. So Albanese is being stained by this because people are blaming him and his people, uh, to use a phrase, for the ongoing complaining about the overwhelming majority of Australians. So this is continuing to damage him. And if, the go if this keeps going on and on and on, it's very hard for him to get clear air on cost of living. How does he get cost of living up if all we see every day is the more extreme elements of the S campaign, like this fellow Thomas Mayo, complaining about Australians having voted against his rather extreme proposal. Well, it's funny you mentioned that about uh, front page of the uh, Fin Review. Uh, Roy Morgan, uh, yesterday, uh, again, Coalition 50.5, Labor 49.5, that on two-party preferred. Now, again, Sam, elections are a long way away, but we're now into the game about cost of living. Now, again, the government... Uh, Post-referendum, Albo stands up and says, hey, there's this long list of achievements, go back to people and talk to them, right? Among them, you know, the release of Chung Lei, right? Wonderful thing that took place, but I'm not entirely sure the suburbs are going to grind to a hold over that conversation. <laughs> but the reality is, is that they're in a position right now, right? Got $20 billion surplus, they could cut fuel excess by 25 cents tomorrow for six months, cost $3 billion, but they won't do it, right? Um, literally, the food insecurity stuff, they could turn around and cut a cheque for $250 million to Food Bank tomorrow but they won't do it. They could turn around and say the low to middle income uh, um, $1,500 that was there as an automatic tax return, well, we'll put it back for next year or we'll reverse the decision for this year. They've got the buffer to do it, but they're just not doing it, yet they're turning around and saying, oh, but we're doing something about cost of living. Well, for I, who? Yeah, look, I guess to the, to the point about the polls is you're absolutely right. The honeymoon ended, I don't know, six, eight months ago, but no-one was really focused on that because everyone was thinking about The Voice. Now The Voice is gone and clearly the honeymoon has ended. This, this happens in first-term governments. If you think back to, you know, every first-term government around this point, now's where the rubber really hits the road. Uh, and that's Because so, you've run out of reviews. Well, well yeah. Or, or and, commissions and, in this but, government's But the case. reality of governing sets in. You know, I mean, you think back all the way to John Howard's first government that, you know, everyone now holds up as this amazing, amazing government. Frankly, he almost lost the first election. Well, yeah, and he survived, right? He was the last opposition leader that survived his first term. So... That, that period, this period that we're in now, is fraught with danger. Mm. And, yes, I sincerely hope that Albanese does have a reboot in his, in his bottom drawer that he's going to pull out. And hopefully... You know, I work for Vinnie's, right? So all those things that you say is music to my ears. You know, hopefully he and Jim Chalmers do pull out a cost-of-living uh, package in addition to the Stage 3 tax cuts and says, you know, here it is. Here's but, what we're going to help with. Here's what we're going to do. But also, Rita, that cost-of-living issue, right? Now, now, automatically, the way Labor will play is that, that, as they did, Amanda Rishworth, I think the 
social services minister stands up there and says, by the way, I like when we couple dress like this, it's nice, um, is that they turn around and say... Uh, I like you oh, both in a red. We've increased the dole by $56 over two weeks, right, um, every fortnight. Well, that, that's not really going to change anyone's life, right? But, they, but, of course, it's hundreds of millions of dollars that that decision makes. And it's that disconnect between the Canberra mm. decisions where they say, well, we moved over $100 million this way, so everyone, you know, the rising tide helps all boats. Reality is... It's middle-class families that aren't taking anything from the government that are ones that are paying an awful lot more tax but also are the ones having to walk up and down the aisles of the supermarket finding ways to save money, the ones that may well have said, you know what, time to vote for the guy who's going to cut the power by 275 bucks and said it's up through the roof. So unless he's thinking about firing every shot he's got, I don't think there's a way out of this straitjacket that he's created for himself. Well, no, and his own policies are adding to that pressure. Let's not forget that, that the fact that their obsession with net zero their, and, and the cost that has to the economy, to manufacturing, to households, is significant. And that is putting enormous pressure on households. And you've got people who've got mortgages, who've seen 11 interest rate rises in, in a fairly short period of time, so their mortgage payments have, in some cases, doubled. Uh, that money is, is going to be very difficult and very tight, and I think we're starting to see that mortgage stress now. People have perhaps absorbed that, uh, dipped into their savings, but at some point... The, the pain's really going to hit, and I think we're there now. And they really have no plans to improve matters. If anything, we're going to see energy costs continue to rise as they go down this net zero obsession. And this is an opportunity for the coalition, like The Voice, to actually give the electorate a clear choice, to abandon their net zero strategy and... I don't know if they want to embrace nuclear, if they want to embrace uh, all the natural resources we have, whether it's gas, coal. I don't care, but come up with something that is logical, that is rational, that is evidence-based and focused on reliability and cost, not emission targets. And I think you will get a lot of those Labor seats that are wavering. And the coalition has got to stop thinking about those affluent inner-city teal seats and look at the suburbs and the regional areas. That's their future. Michael, what did you think about some of this internal communication about the New South Wales Police and their early reactions to the pro-Hamas protest that took place uh, literally immediately after what took place in Israel? It is extraordinary to me how weak the police were when they knew that there was going to be some level of confrontation and, and antagonism, but they didn't keep them stuck at Town Hall in Sydney. Instead, they marched with them all the way down to the Opera House. They even argued against the lighting of the Opera House as if they should have been given a week's notice. Oh, well, sorry that Hamas didn't send the uh, the, the calendar invite mm. to what their plans were a mm. couple of days before. Um, now, again, I just think that the police... with This, this idea, right, which is, uh, oh, well, don't antagonise people who might end up overreacting to a police presence, well, as soon as you give in to that, well, then you might as well not police anything. Mm. Mate, I'll tell you what. The New South Wales Police, that reads very badly for the New South Wales Police, but I judge them on one thing and one thing only. How many people... It's now two weeks and one day since that horrific neo-Nazi demonstration uh, in Sydney. How many people have the New South Wales police charged with hate crimes, hate speech, religious vilification, over yelling, gas the Jews? You yep. can't tell me, mate, that there isn't footage of faces of people who uttered those words in a, in a reckless and violent and threatening manner. How many people have the New South Wales police charged? Not a single person. Uh, oh, yeah, the, the bloke... The Jewish bloke with the yeah, Israeli the flag. flag. He was oh, the only also, one. Don't forget, there's a twenty-two thousand dollar fine for having for organising a legal protest. Oh, when the organisers yeah, were out yeah, doing the well, apology to the media the next day, they put their head above the parapet, fine them for having the initial mm. protest. Mm. Well, uh, of course, of course they should, but that didn't get worldwide headlines. 
You talk about the damage done to Australia. People say, oh, refugee policy or the no campaign will cause you know, international yeah, headlines and denigration of Australia. I'll tell you what happened, mate. That went worldwide. Never in my life have I seen a demonstration where people are yelling that. And secondly, those people holding those signs from the river to the sea, that is hate speech against, against Jewish people. And why aren't those people being prosecuted? You know, there's a there's a neo-Nazi underbelly to some of these demonstrations where people are holding those signs. It's great that the organisers get up and say anyone who's anti-Semitic should leave this demonstration, but there are still people at those demonstrations with those signs, signs, and that should not happen in Australia. But the New South Wales police, shame on you, two weeks and one day later, not a single person charged for yelling, gas the Jews. Correct. And Michael's 100% right. Um, when that happened the morning after, I had messages from all across America, all across mm. Europe, mm. saying, what is going on in Australia? Because that footage went viral very quickly. In the days of social media, you, you can't suppress that. And that has done enormous damage to Australia's reputation. Obviously, it's deeply disturbed the de Jewish community. That was supposed to be a moment of solidarity mm. for the Jewish community with the, with the uh, Opera House... Uh, lit up in the colours of the Israeli flag, but they weren't allowed to be there. They weren't allowed to mourn together at that iconic site because police told them not to go for their own safety. And then you have that chant and it has just done enormous damage and there has to be some consequences. But we see this with the cops repeatedly. We saw it during COVID mm. with the BLM march where, again, the Victoria police in that instance were worried that if they went in and did something there and made arrests, uh, then the, the crowd would become antagonised and react. So it's almost like mob rule. If, mm. if a crowd is likely to become violent, they, they are given leeway to do as they wish. The That's rubber bullets not how are civilised society pajamas is supposed to work. If they disagree. Michael, Sam, mm. I love you. Rita, I love you the most. Talk to you all soon, very soon. Good luck in your travels, big fella. Thank, Thank you. All right. We'll see you all again very shortly. Nigel Farage standing by with plenty to say, including some breaking news this evening, is that uh, that woman that you can see on uh, your TV screen right now. She's a released hostage by Hamas. The woman to her left is her daughter, who actually appeared on Shari's show a couple of weeks ago. Incredible. More in a sec. You'll hear from her and Nigel next. Hamas have released four hostages. Two were American, two were Israeli. One is an elderly Israeli woman, and she spoke at a hospital in the past couple of hours. They gave us pita bread and hard cheese and some uh, low-fat cream cheese and that was our f and a cucumber. That was our food for the entire day. We were the scapegoats. They had warned us three weeks before. But the masses, they came to our roads and they burnt our fields. They sent balloons with fire and burnt our fields. And the IDF didn't take that seriously. Now, interesting her comments there about the failures of Israeli Defence Force at the very start of the press conference, which is uh, hard for us to turn around, but uh, she spoke about her experience as being hell-like, that she was uh, taken, thrown on the back of a... Uh, motorcycle beaten, but then once she got to Gaza, was kept relatively peaceful and actually taken care of doctors while in the tunnels. Nigel Farage joins us now from London, where you too have had the protests and there's been a much tougher edge than some of the ones that have happened here, um, even at the Opera House. Well, yes, I, mean, I think the words that were uttered at the Opera House were perhaps the vilest that we've heard anywhere around the world. But I think what happened in London on Saturday with 100,000 people on the streets uh, was different in the sense that, yes, of course, uh, they were shouting jihad, they were shouting curse to the Jews, and I'm being allowed to do this, which is totally astonishing. Uh, but it was the intimidatory atmosphere. It was the, the real difficulty that the police had uh, in dealing with a lot of very aggressive young men. Uh, I tell you what, uh, to anybody that told us 20 years ago that all diversity was good, the more people we allowed in from different cultures, the richer and better our country would be. Well, have a look at what happened last Saturday. And it, you know, I don't want to be too critical of the police because I get 
how difficult it was for them. But we're living in a world of complete double standards because, you see, there were two young lads turned up on Saturday holding an English cross of St George. And the policeman goes over to them and says, now, no racist language, please. Yeah. <laughs> As if, because you've got the English... Because you know, you've got the English flag, you're necessarily going to yeah. be a bad dude. And these were just a couple of lads having a bit of fun. Well, they were, you know, taking a bit of a risk. Um, and there was also supposed to be um, a march in a place called Golders Green in North London, which is the epicentre of the London Jewish community. And the police advised the local Jewish community, that that march shouldn't go ahead. So what we're beginning to see is something of a surrender where radical Islam can voice its, its name in the streets. But in Berlin, I don't know whether you've seen this, Paul. This is huge. In Berlin, violent scuffles, violent scuffles with the police. And, and, and just sort of think about this. In the country in 1945 that said never again and with extremely good reason... Uh, Jewish houses having stars of David painted on their front door. And Schultz, the Chancellor, responded in an interview in Der Spiegel, which was published yesterday, by saying, we're going to have to start with deportations. So there are some signs that some governments are going to get tough, but the problem is, uh, since 2015, when millions have crossed the Mediterranean in those open boats, and since Angela Merkel and the European Commission said everybody is welcome, we now have some very, very big populations, you know, numbered in their millions, who are, uh, you know, instinctively, tribally, taking the Hamas side in what is going on in the Middle East. Uh, Europe has built up for itself simply the most enormous problem going ahead. And the incredible thing, while well, the world is at this tinderbox right now, we have this bloke in charge of the United States who crumbles before our very eyes. I'm frightened that he is the one who's supposedly going to be able to pull every lever and create peace in our time. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, the guy is a complete duffer. He is senile, let's just call it what it is. Uh, and he is also very responsible for much of what has happened. He was the vice president when the Iran nuclear deal was done. It freed up tens of billions of dollars for the Iranian regime. All they had to do was promise they wouldn't develop nuclear weapons. Well, guess what? They've gone ahead developing nuclear weapons and they've used that free money to fund Hamas and Hezbollah. And Biden is directly responsible for that catastrophic policy error. It was Trump afterwards, of course, who brought in the Abraham Accords to start to bring Arab countries together with Israel in peace pacts, very successful. Saudi Arabia was on the verge of doing something. Uh, and, and, and frankly, uh, you know, Biden's visit uh, to Israel uh, the fact that other leaders wouldn't see him, I thought, was very, very significant. And then on the plane going back, he could barely utter a word. So, uh, yeah, you know, the leader of the free world does not give us, does not inspire great confidence. But that's all right. The B-52s are playing when our Prime Minister's there in the next couple of days. That'll solve everything. Nigel, thank you. Do appreciate it. We'll talk to you again next week and hopefully for a little bit longer. All right, quick break. Back with more, plenty more to talk about, including what I think is going to be a big problem. For Albo in Western Sydney, and no, it is not the voice. More in a second. Now, Sydney already has an international airport, but apparently there was a great need for a second Sydney International Airport. Now, that will open in 2026. But, you see, despite the fact that uh, the airport in Sydney which is currently uh, the electorate which the Prime Minister represents, has a curfew. Western Sydney International Airport will be operating for 24 hours. And we learned today about just which type of areas and just how many Labor seats are going to be affected by aircraft noise in the middle of the night, let alone what's about to happen over the top of people in Penrith. Now... Cheekily, all of this, again, will happen when it opens in 2026, after the next federal election. But if it's good enough for people to be able to sleep through the night in Albo's electorate of Marrickville, could the Prime Minister please tell us why the people of Penrith won't be able to sleep through the night? Why they, currently with no aircraft noise, should put up with hundreds of it every day? Apart from the fact that they vote Liberal. We'll be talking about that plenty more in the next little while. Here's a late debate.